And now pushing on to the back half of chapter two, we are looking at the Ragged Tribe Camp. The Ragged Tribe Camp is where you're going to interact with a lot of the Ragged Nomads that hang around this place. There's a lot of different tribes, a lot of different NPCs that are going on here, and there's a lot of ways you can encounter them. So as you can tell by this map, we can see here that there is no location for the Ragged Tribe Camp, and that is because they can be encountered all over the place. They are a nomadic people. They set up for only a small amount of time, and then they promptly leave. They are chasing after herds, they are avoiding scary places, they are going around and making sure that their way of living thrives on. So these Reagan tribe camps can be located anywhere, but what is the purpose for your players going there? Well, one of them could simply be just a random encounter you have out in the wilderness. You could simply stumble across one of the camps, or you could encounter one of the tribe members as they are going around hunting. But of course, just like the other areas, we have Tall Tales and a quest that can get us there. So let's go ahead and take a look at that, shall we? For the Tall Tale that takes us to the Ragged Tribe Camp, we have... If you're looking for something hidden in Icewind Dale, the people you should talk to are the Ragged Nomads. They know every inch of this land and all its secrets. The tricky part is finding them. They tend to follow the reindeer herds. And that is a good way to get your players out there. In either one, they start searching for the Reagan Nomads immediately, or two, they stumble across a herd and know that where there is a herd, there is Reagan Nomads and not too far away. Of course, if you're going down this route, you probably want to give your players some survival checks and perception checks, investigation checks, to try and find where the Reagan Nomads are. For the quest that can take us to one of the Reagan Nomad camps, we have the Wolf Tribe Cannibals, and this one's terrifying. One of the nearby tribes, a wolf tribe, has resorted to cannibalism. Someone is going to arrive in town, and this person, Aluka, who is in fact actually a werewolf, is going to come to town and say, hey, our camp is resorting to cannibalism, and we actually have a halfling in our possession, and we're going to eat them pretty soon. A whole bunch of trappers and furs are disappearing, and the halfling is not the first, and more importantly, this halfling won't be the last. If your players don't interact with the cannibals, then more people are going to end up disappearing, and that is going to be pretty grisly, honestly. Once your players arrive, they'll be able to find a honeybee little bucket. This halfling who is trying to, you know, make a living by simply catching hares. But the thing is, is the cannibals are going to try and eat her. The halfling's trying to catch hares to, you know, try and feed all the cannibals, but so far hasn't caught anything. And unfortunately, her time is running out, and if she doesn't catch anything soon, she will be eaten, and then the wolf tribe is going to go on to get someone else. This is terrifying, and mind you, this quest actually doesn't have a resolution tied into it. You are going to have to come up with that yourself. What are your players going to do with these cannibals? Are they just going to go ahead and kill them? Are they going to try and find some way to give them substance? What are your players going to do? That is something you're going to have to think about a lot in regards of how to get your players involved with this quest, if they get involved with this quest at all. This tribe is probably going to have a decent amount of people, maybe anywhere between 30 and 40 people. So it doesn't seem reasonable that only a single person would be able to catch enough food to feed all of them, especially if they're only catching rabbits, right? So you should keep that into consideration that if you want to run this quest, they're going to have to think of a long-term solution in order to get food. Are they going to go ahead and, you know, kill more of their own tribe and thus they have less meat to share around? Are they going to go ahead and just start picking off people from the nearby towns? Are they going to have to actually find a really suitable herd nearby? Maybe there's a mammoth nearby and you can go ahead and kill that and that'll feed them for a bit. There's a lot of different ways you can handle this quest and really there's really no wrong way to handle this quest. You can just leave it as is where these people are totally evil, eating people left, right, and center. Or you can have it where they are truly desperate and only doing whatever it takes to survive and are willing to latch on to the nearest thing that will help them out. Another way you can get your players tied into heading to one of the many Ragged Nomad tribe camps around here is the fact that one of your players could be a Ragged Nomad themselves and gave up that life a while ago and is hanging around the Ten Towns and decides to go ahead and check up on the family and see what's up. Maybe you could say that there is a nice little rotation. The tribes always go in a certain pattern around and, you know, make perfect circles. And thus your player automatically knows, hey, I know for a fact that around this time, this tribe is going to be exactly around that lake or it's going to be around that forest, etc., etc. 
Another reason why your players could go ahead and seek out the Regated Nomad Tribes is the fact that they do in fact have some good info to share. Some of them might be tied to O'Reel and you can go ahead and allude to that. The fact that these people are able to survive out in the elements must clearly mean that some of them are going ahead and bending a knee to the Frost Maiden all around. And maybe that added insight can go ahead and help out your players in able to find out how to put a stop to the Frost Maiden's curse. And another quest you can go ahead and bake up is the fact that the Reagan Nomads typically don't head to the towns. They don't like interacting with civilization. But at the same time, they do need supplies. So you could go ahead and say that one Reagan Nomad member shows up to a town and says, Hey, we need supplies and we're willing to trade. And you can go ahead and set up some sort of trade within the city and the Reagan Nomads. They go ahead and offer up medical supplies and maybe some foods. And the Nomads go ahead and sell off some of the goods that they've acquired along the way. Probably being bone and antlers and things of that nature. Regardless of how your players show up to a Reagan Nomad camp, they will go ahead and see the following. Your players will be able to see that the Reagan Nomads basically set up their tents as follows. There are smaller tents ringed around the outside of their circle, and that is for the commoner people. Then there is a ring of inside tents, which is in fact, of course, the more warrior peoples. And directly in the center is the meeting place for all the Reagan Nomads. For each tribe's camp roster here, we have a Chieftain, we have a Great Warrior, we have a Shaman, we have 36 Hunters and Warriors, 24 Non-Combatants, and 36 Dog Sluds. That is a lot of people to keep track of, honestly. That is a lot of management that is going on around here. And mind you, these people aren't just sitting around doing nothing all day. They are constantly having to work to survive. The Hunters are going out and capturing food. The non-combatants are cleaning, they're cooking, they're setting up the tents, they're putting up the tents, you know, they are constantly getting ready to move. There's a lot of things going on here, and it's just a lot of management to have. The nomads have to feed a lot of people and a lot of these dogs. They need a lot of wood because they are constantly burning a lot of wood because, lo and behold, you know, they'll freeze to death if they don't put up some campfires around, of course. There's a lot of things going on to make this not-so-civilized nation move around. The general layout isn't really anything too special. Like I said before, the non-combatant tents on the outside. On the inner circle is the chieftains, the shamans, and the warriors' huts. And, of course, there is a little bit of treasure to be had here. In the shaman's tent, you can go ahead and find some potions of healing and lesser restoration scrolls. Nothing too major, though. For life in a ragged camp, we get some really good information on how these people survive. They are constantly moving around, they are constantly fishing, and hunting, and eating, and trading. They're doing a lot of things, and honestly, this winter here has made their resolve even stronger, because they know for a fact that the people in those puny little civilizations and towns, they are going to crumble thanks to the winter, but the ragged nomads are a hardy people, and they will outlive the cold. And we also get some good information on ragged stories here, Reagan nomads pass time by sharing stories, and this is, you know, makes sense. Like, it, the elders would be teaching the children all about their philosophies and spiritualities. The tribe is one spirit, always on the move. As the tribe goes, so goes the spirit of the tribe. For the tribe to survive, its members must all work together and help one another. No member gets left behind. The land respects strength alone. The strong flourish and the weak perish. These are the ideals that are pressed upon the Reagan nomads, and this is what allows them to work together in the harshest of times and survive all the bitter cold and all the other elements that are going on around the world. And would you look at these guys? These guys look hardy. You know, these, these people look like they know what they're doing here. And showing off here, of course, we have the tribe of the elk, the tribe of the bear, the tribe of the wolf, and the tribe of the tiger. Each of them has their own distinct personalities and traits and we'll be getting into right now all of their leaders first off we have the tribe of the bear the tribe of the bear is sadly a fractured state right now a lot of their members were lost due to the fact that some of them came into contact with chartalin and in fact you can of course encounter these people because they are in fact chartalin berserkers for the king of the bear tribe we have gunvald hrogelson and this guy is pretty unique He's this big, towering guy, he's strong, he's fierce, he's awesome. 
But the thing is, is one, he's annoyed, of course, by the fact that his tribe is so defeated recently. And two, he's more defeated for another reason. In the past six years, he has had three wives, each of whom have died while they were pregnant. He believes that he is cursed by the gods, but there is a reason why these women are dying. The king's doting shaman, Ulcora, is actually poisoning the woman because she lusts for the king. She is hoping that eventually the king will turn his gaze to her and they can join as one. And that right there, that is fascinating. You can just play up so much stuff with that. If your players interact with the bear tribe, they can get to know King Gunvald and, you know, maybe investigate around and see that, oh, you know, all these women, they've all died from a similar cause. But then you look, poke around the shaman's tent and see that, oh, hey, there might be some poison here that has no business being here. You can definitely play that up and have a lot of cool political intrigue. And maybe you could even play up the mysticism behind it. Maybe they could say that there was a little bit of magic involved, but hey, she's a shaman. She could conjure up some magic, and she is totally going to be the reason why. But it's up to your players to suss out that she was, in fact, the one that killed all these wives. The tribe of the elk is, in fact, the largest tribe right now and is the most tolerant of all the outsiders. This tribe looks at all the ten tanners and realizes how weak they are and don't really like getting involved with them. Because whenever they do get around nearby, all the ten tanners begin to panic because they think that they're going to get attacked. For the king of the elk tribe, we have Yerand Elkhart. And this guy is, once again, a very towering individual. But the interesting thing about this guy is that he's old. He is a whopping 50 years old. That is ancient in regards of these nomadic peoples because they live a lot more harsh lives and die more frequently. This guy has been leading the tribe for half of his life, and the wear and tear of having to lead all these people and having so many people die all around him is kind of starting to wear on him. His son died a decade ago, and he hasn't been able to bear any more children, and he often turns to his shaman, Mjainer, for advice. Mjainer believes that the only way to stop Oriel's everlasting winter is to slay her at her home, but, of course, the, the king believes that no one's going to be strong enough to actually take on O'Reel. So you can definitely have that exposition of, oh, there is definitely a way we can stop O'Reel, but we are too weak for it. Maybe you are strong enough to do it. And that can point your players in the right direction into getting them to O'Reel's abode. For the tribe of the tiger, we see that the tribe is basically predatory. They avoid the elk tribe and they pick on the bear and the wolf tribes. These people just go around and they capture, slay, and are conquerors. And they don't just attack the other tribes, they also attack some of the ten towners whenever they get the opportunity. For the queen of the tiger tribe, we have Bjornhild Solving's daughter. She is a powerhouse. She was actually married to the king, but the king died in battle when a frost giant's mammoth slew him. His name was Korold, and Bjornhild took her place. And she did pretty dang well. Bjornhild openly worships the Frost Maiden, and she is so ruthless to her enemies that people believe she has ice running through her veins. She is terrifying. She is willing to capture, kill, and do whatever it takes to survive. And she knows that she and her companions are strong enough to do it. She doesn't have any kids, but she doesn't need kids. She knows that she will be immortalized through her actions and through her deeds. And through these, the tribe will live on, and thus she will live on. And if she wasn't badass enough already, she has a pet saber-toothed tiger named Grava. So you should play her up as the kind of person that isn't going to take no for an answer. You should play her up as the individual that is doing whatever it takes and she doesn't give a damn about the consequences because she can handle the consequences. And the last tribe we have here is the tribe of the wolf. The tribe of the wolf is the smallest and weakest of all of the tribes right now. And so much so is it small that unfortunately the tribe is having to take on anybody that is willing to come. They are taking 10 towners that have been thrown out. They are taking other tribe members that are being thrown out. And they're even willing to take goblinoids. For the king of the tribe of the wolf, we actually don't have a true king. They actually have been kingless for some time. They haven't been actually able to truly elect anybody. 
the person that seems to have the most clout between all of the tribes of the wolf is Isar Kronenstrom. This guy is crazy. He is a psychotic brute that worships Malar the Beast Lord, and he hunts people for sport and bathes in their blood. Because this guy is crazy, a lot of people have either deserted him or been killed off, but there is a few that are still loyal to him. They believe that he is a chosen of Malar, but, you know, Malar doesn't care about this guy. Isar calls himself the Wolf King, however, not all of the tribes support him, but unfortunately, the other Wolf Clan chieftains are too weak and disorganized to challenge him. So you should totally play that up. If you go to one of the tribes and it doesn't have Isar in it, then maybe you play up their disloyalty and say, hey, you know, we have this guy in charge and he sucks, but unfortunately we're too weak or, too, you know, we can't be bothered. Maybe you can do something about it. And maybe your party can go ahead and try and put a stop to this horrific person and finally unite the wolf tribe and get them strong again. There's a lot of cool politics you can play with all these tribes. There's a lot of number crunching you can do. You can go ahead and say that there's 10 tribes of the elk and there's 8 tribes of the tiger, 5 tribes of the bear, and maybe 4 of the wolf. You can definitely play around with those numbers a lot and you can totally play it up as you know, things being fractured or things being moved around a bit. And most important of all is the fact that each of these chieftains has their own stat block. So they really intended you to use these because these stat blocks are interesting. And most important of all, they have their own attributes that set them apart to be unique. So as we can see here, Gunvald has Indomitable, Menacing Blows, Second Wind. Gerund has Brute. That's actually really strong. Bjornhild has Oriel's Blessing. That definitely hurts. And Asar has Blood Frenzy, Indomitable, and Keen Hearing and Smell. You can totally play up so many things about these characters and it's really unique. But sadly, even though we get all this information about what's going on between all these tribes and what's going on within the tribes themselves, we get information on how many numbers there are for each individual tribe. We don't get true numbers on how many tribes there are floating around in the Regan North. And also, most important of all is... We don't get any other quests that tie us to the Ragged Tribes. Yes, we get the one quest that involves the cannibals, but I would have definitely loved to seen a lot more quests that have us interacting with the other tribes, you know, interacting with themselves, trying to get some political intrigue going on, trying to try and get some more information on how these tribal leaders are interacting with each other because there is just so many things you can do with it. Sky's the limit, really. But unfortunately, at the end of the day is... These are people that are going around the tundras and not interacting with society. And I'm willing to bet that most groups don't want to have to go out all the time into the middle of nowhere and interact with people that aren't going to affect the towns. So you should play up the fact that if the ragged tribes don't get their acts together, they are going to go ahead and start having to interact with the towns, maybe in a good way, but even more importantly, in a bad way. They could go ahead and just start invading the towns. They could just start killing off all their people. They could just be stealing all their food, cutting off their supplies. There's so many things that the ragged tribes could be doing, interacting with the world that your players already know and love, that it really presses upon them to actually act and help out with the situations at hand. I know for a fact that if you hop online and interact with all the other DMs, then people are going to go ahead and suggest ways that you can interact with the tribes. There's going to be some online supplements you can go ahead and buy that are going to be dealing with quests involving with the Reagan Nomads. Uh, and most important of all, you have your own creative imagination and you can do so many things with these guys. These people are fascinating. There's a lot of things going on with them. They are just as interesting as the Ten Towners. There's just a lot of NPCs that you can throw into the mix. There's a lot of political intrigue you can throw in there. And most important of all is the fact that these people are trying to fight to survive. And their struggle is harder than the other people's. And you can totally play that up. These people are dying. And if they do not get help, they will die out. So, are your players going to be able to change the tides of the Ragged Nomads, or are they going to succumb to O'Reel's frigid winter? But other than that, really not much more to say about the Ragged Nomads, other than, you know, start getting creative if you want to incorporate these guys, because sky's the limit with these people. Our next location we will be taking a look at is Revel's End. Revel's End is a prison which is located... Pretty much at the end of the world, there's really not much going on past this place. Uh, so it makes sense that 
if you have a bunch of prisoners you don't like, you're going to send them as far away from civilization as possible. And mind you, these prisoners aren't just from Icemendale. More often than not, these prisoners are from actually further down south. As we'll be getting to in a moment, the prisoners of Revel's End are people that have done something bad to the Lord's Alliance. The Lord's Alliance being a conglomeration of the major cities down in the south, Baldur's Gate, Neverwinter, Waterdeep, etc, etc. So we have this prison locked away in the far, far north. We have prisoners that have done something incredibly bad and are at least imprisoned here for at least a year, but typically a lot more. The thing is, why would your players show up to a prison? Well, of course, you have many awesome tie-ins. Let's go ahead and start diving into those, shall we? For our tall tale, we have... I keep telling everyone that Everlasting Rhyme isn't the Frost Maidens doing. It's actually the Arcane Brotherhood, plotting another takeover of Ten Towns. A wizard who was burned at the stake in East Haven admitted to being one of them, and he said there are other Arcane Brotherhood wizards lurking among us. Valish Gant is behind it all, no doubt. The scoundrel is locked away in Revel's End, but that doesn't make him any less dangerous. Someone should find out what he knows. So, as I constantly harp on, introduce the Arcane Brotherhood early. Get them into the campaign, because they are an excellent addition. If your players have no understanding at all whatsoever of the Arcane Brotherhood, then this is a little bit of, you know, unique mystery that you can definitely add in very early on. But I promise you, if you already introduced many of the members of the Arcane Brotherhood, and then they hear this piece of information, they'll be like, whoa, you know, is the Arcane Brotherhood, like, are they on the up and up? Are they bad? What's going on? Who are they? What are they doing? And they'll have these questions, and unfortunately for them, the only way they'll be able to get an answer is by going to Revel's End and interrogating a prisoner. For a quest to actually get us to Revel's End, we have Behind Bars. The speaker of Bryn Shander, a one Duvessa Shane, is putting out a reward of 250 gold for anybody that goes and gets some solid information on the Arcane Brotherhood because the guy that they're going to interrogate, a one Valish Gant, oh so many years ago, he actually tried overthrowing the town of Bryn Shander, but the thing about it is, is he wasn't exactly doing it in the name of the Arcane Brotherhood. He was definitely doing it for the Arcane Brotherhood, but the Arcane Brotherhood did not instruct him to do so. He was just trying to make things a lot easier for the future. So she's willing to offer up this money to get any information out of Valish Gant. However, if Valish Gant doesn't offer any reward at all, then she's going to go ahead and instruct the players and say, hey, the Arcane Brotherhood might be plotting a prison escape. In which case, it's going to make Valish Gant's life a lot worse, and it's going to make Duvessa's a little bit happier. So this quest is great because it gives you insight on what's going on and how the Arcane Brotherhood may or may not operate in certain regions, and how this one individual already arrived here many years ago and tried shaking up the place. What are some other reasons why your players might decide to trek out to the middle of nowhere to go to a prison? Well, we have, for starters, the fact that they could in fact be an escapist of Revel's End and going back there to gather some information from a prisoner that they couldn't before. Of course, they would have to do so disguised because they escaped from this place and they're presumably on a wanted list. Another reason, of course, could be the fact that there could be a family member or a long-lost friend who is currently serving their time at Revel's End and they have some very important information to share. What is that information? It could be on O'Reel, it could be on the Duragar, it could be on the Ragged Tribes, it could be on so many different things, and it is a great way to exposition your way forward in this campaign. You could have that one uncle who swears he saw footprints in the snow, but no one making them, and it was heading down south. You could have that friend who fell to O'Reel's gaze and now serves her and might have some good info on where O'Reel lives. You could have that ragged nomad who converted to cannibalism when things were looking dire, but at least can give you some good insight on how the tribes interact with each other. There's no end to what you could actually feed into the prison because, of course, you know, just having a prison, you know, prisoners are exciting. There's so many things you can do with them. And lastly, another reason why your players could be showing up to Revel's End is the fact that supplies are running low in the Ten Towns. People are running out of medicines, they're running out of foods, they're running out of blankets, they're running out of a lot of resources, and people could be whispering and saying, hey, up there there's a prison, and I know for a fact that the Lord's Alliance keeps them well stocked, and what do prisoners need that stupid food for? We need that food. 
So maybe a whole bunch of 10-towners go to Revel's End and you can escort them. Or maybe a whole bunch of 10-towners go and ask the players to go to Revel's End and procure a whole bunch of these resources for better use. There is a lot of reasons why your players could be showing up to Revel's End. And we can see here that the place is pretty cool. However, it is sadly in the adventure lacking a true quest. So let's go ahead and dive right into the location itself. So first off, this is what Rebels End looks like from the sky view here. We have, it is located super duper far north. Like there is just frozen tundra and nothing else all around. It is built up next to a rock. And this rock is very important because it's a windbreaker. So the wind, instead of pounding the Revel's End the entire time, it's, it's kind of going over. But also, as we can see here, there is actually a large elevator. And this elevator goes all the way down to the sea. And this is important because, of course, you know, they normally don't get supplies over land. They get supplies by sea. So once again, fantastic art. And it really shows us what the location would actually look like. Mind you, this tower itself isn't the actual prison. All of the prisoners reside on the ground floor. So this is our prison. It's a little star fortress, and it's got some really awesome stuff going on. Basically, there's open courtyards on either side, and then there's a pantry, and then a kitchen on another side. And it's going for this cool, symmetrical, yet asymmetrical look, and I absolutely dig it. So here in the section on Revel's End, we can see all the things that I talked about before. This place holds all the prisoners of the Lord's Alliance. This place is well protected. You know, even if prisoners do escape, it's typically, you know, death sentence because they're out in the middle of the frozen tundra. It's pretty hard to make your way out of civilization. But we also get some cool information on the Absolution Council, which is essentially a parole committee. They come around and if they see that a prisoner is doing well, then once a year, and then not more than once a year, they'll come together and say yay or nay on letting this prisoner go free early. And there's some people, as we're going to get to see, that always vote yes, and there's some people that always vote no, and there's some people that think with their hearts. For involving the characters, we get the aforementioned little quest involved and the tall tales, but also is the fact that people could come to Revel's End to book a ship. And booking the ship is a, one of the ways that your players will be able to get to O'Reel's abode in the future. So this is something very important to recognize. There's going to be multiple ways for your players to get to O'Reel's abode. And during any one campaign, they may not go to all the other locations. But you should, at the bare minimum, at least introduce one of the locations that is going to be able to transport them to O'Reel's abode. For prison features, we get the following. Doors and hatches can only be opened by prison personnel. If you are not a prison personnel, then your only way of getting through is by beating it up. And these doors have an AC of 19, a damage threshold of 10, and hit points of 30. So what that means is a damage threshold of 10, meaning that it would be literally impossible to punch these doors open because punching only does one damage plus your strength mod. And in order for it to actually do damage, you have to do more than 10. So it's impossible to punch these doors down. You would need some type of weapon in order to actually break these things down. For heating, we get the fact that this place is actually magically insulated. Thank God! It is a cool 68 degrees at any given point, which is a heck of a lot better than the rest of the 10 towns are doing. That's for dang sure. For lighting, every single location that isn't specified has a continual flame brightly lit. And even more so, some of the locations actually have continual flames that can be dimmed, which is pretty dope. For prison guards here, we have a garrison of 75 prison guards that are actually using the veteran stat block, which is actually pretty dang good. And they work in 8 hour rotations. So there's 25 veterans on duty at any given point. And presumably what it means is 25 are working, 25 are R&R, and then 25 are sleeping. And for prisoners here, we can see that there is only a handful of prisoners. At any given point, there's only 4d12 prisoners in Revel's End. But what's cool about these prisoners is that they're not even allotted their names. Each prisoner is given a number, and this number never repeats. So, in fact, one of the prisoners that's still located in here is named Prisoner 6, because he's been here so long. And the newest prisoner is, in fact, Prisoner 299. So, and once someone decides to break the law and get sent here, they'll be lucky number 300. Good job! 
Each inmate wears a uniform that consists of a hoodless robe with no pockets, leather slippers without laces, and cloth undergarments. So no tools, no tricks, no nothing. And while outside their cells, they must wear manacles around their wrist and their ankles. And this is really going to prevent them from doing anything crazy, and it's going to prevent them from casting spells, and it's going to prevent them from doing a lot of things. So this is a prison out in the middle of nowhere, and it's not typically protocol for a lot of people to show up here. But as we can see here in this area approaching the prison, as long as your players show up and they don't do have any ill intent at all and are willing to abide by the rules, they're allowed in. You're allowed to just simply walk on in. Mind you, you're not allowed to stay here. You're allowed to stay here for two days, after which they'll say, hey, you know, <laughs> you're it's prison, what are you doing here? We get some information here on the guards on watch and how they're constantly on the look. They are looking for things arriving by sea, by land, and most important of all, by air, because, you know, if a dragon starts showing up, of course they're going to get ready. <laughs> Once your players are allotted inside, they have to give up their weapons, because, of course, you have to get rid of your weapons. It's a friggin' prison. If your players are feeling particularly sneaky, they can go ahead and make a DC 13 sleight of hand check and be able to sneak in a dagger or a similar sized weapon. Once inside, the warden is going to come down and ask them, hey, what are you doing here? You know, it's a prison. It's not typical for people to show up. But if your players are seeking shelter, then the warden grants them temporary access and they can stay here for up to two days and two nights. But if the characters are showing up to meet a prisoner, the warden can facilitate this meeting and bring that person in for questioning. If something is going on, either the prison is getting attacked, or if there's a prison escape, or just something's really, really fishy about something going on in the prison, then the warden can go ahead and just yell out, Maristo. And when she calls this out, several things will happen. For one minute, a horn will blare, and the continual flame spells will all of a sudden turn a reddish blue. The guards off duty are going to go ahead and don all their armors and weapon, and make their way downstairs. And the warden and all prison guards will gain the benefit of sea invisibility. And that is huge because I promise you there's a decent amount of people who might try and plan some prison escape and be able to cast invisibility. Well, psych, you, <laughs> you're not invisible anymore. So with that being said, we get some awesome information about the prison itself. We are going to get some cool information on the named NPCs that are located around here. But the thing is, is if you quickly glance through... There is sadly no actual quest tied to this place. There is no quest in regards of getting a prison escape going on here. There is no information at all about that, sadly. And that really sucks because there's a lot of missed opportunity with this. Thankfully, there is a lot of people who are working on supplements for escaping Revel's End. And I'm sure those are going to be absolutely fantastic. Not to say that Revel's End is worthless, mind you. There's a lot of fun things you can do with this location. I'm not going to be going over every single location like I do in the other places because, quite frankly, if I just say, you know, one, the pier, ship, ship docks, offload prisons and supplies, there's really not much more I can really add to the situation that you can't already drum up yourself. I will be looking at several locations and specifically some NPCs and we can go ahead and zhush all that up. Like a perfect example here is Area 7, the Counselor's Quarters. So there's currently 10 quarters here, and they are all for the counselors of the representatives of the Lord's Alliance. But the thing is, not all 10 representatives are here at any given point. Why would they be? This place sucks, it's miserable, there's no reason to be here all day every day, you know, if you're just watching over some stupid prisoners and deciding on their vote every once in a while. So more often than not, they just don't need to be here. Currently, there is three council members, and they are... Counselor Voss Anderton, he is the representative of Neverwinter, and he takes his role very seriously, and whenever there is a vote decided about releasing a prisoner, he votes with his head and not with his heart, and carefully weighs the ramifications of commuting a prisoner's sentence. So you could definitely drum that up. You could say that, oh, there was someone that embezzled a ton of money from Neverwinter, and of course, he being from Neverwinter would hate that. But at the same time, if this person's sentence was commuted, then they could go back and do good things for the city of Neverwinter. So that would definitely be one of the reasons why he would be voting with his head and not with his heart. Next up, we have Counselor Jill Torbo. And she is always voting yes on commuting people. She doesn't have a sense of humor. She just sighs all the time when people are annoying her. 
But at the same time, she also gives people the benefit of the doubt. She's always willing to let people go free. And lastly, here we have Counselor Kriv Norixius, and he is from Daggerford. He is trying to impress the Duchess of Daggerford and is not willing to let people go because, in his mind, criminals are bad, okay? So you can see here that with these three individuals, if you start role-playing up that they are going to commute a sentence, then you're going to have automatically one yes, automatically one no, and then you're going to have someone who's going to be the swing vote, but they're going to be looking at it as rationally as possible. So... Unfortunately for us as a DM, that's already kind of predetermined if they're going to commute someone. So I would strongly recommend that if you do in fact want to role play out someone getting commuted, then maybe you add two more people from other towns and have them be swingy and have them be swayed by, you know, talk and by record and all that fun stuff. In Area 10, we have the Armory. And what's really odd about the armory is that they have wrangled a spectator into spectating the place. This spectator recognizes all the guards and lets them in willy-nilly. But if anybody else makes their way in here, that spectator is going to start blasting. So sadly, we don't get any information on how to roleplay this spectator. But you should definitely play him up as most beholder kin. He is pompous. He is, you know, an enigma. He is scary, but at the same time, he's just doing his job, and he's just going to sit here and guard the place. And if your players show up and they don't have guards accompanying them, then lo and behold, they are going to get zapped left, right, and center. In Area 17, we have the cells, and this is where we get the good information on the prisoners and why it's so freaking hard to escape. Each cell has an anti-magical field, the doors are impossible to, you know, batter and damage, and this thing is just impossible to get through. And even more so is the fact that there are several veterans always stationed and always staring at all these cells. So it'd be super duper hard for anybody to get out of here. There's 24 cells in total. And what it states here is you just simply roll 40, 12. And that's how many prisoners are currently active in the prison. One of which will be prisoner 6, which we get no information on. One of which is prisoner 299, which we get no information on. But one of them is going to be Prisoner 237. And this is the guy that your players may have come here because they know about him, because he is in fact an Arcane Brotherhood member, or at least was an Arcane Brotherhood member. If you're feeling a little bit of creative writer's block in regards of making these prisoners come to life, we get some good information here, this little D6 table of what possible prisoners could be here, a noble who was doing some slave trading, a spy that was convicted of espionage, etc., etc. And area 18 here, we have the surveillance hub, and this is where those veterans are going to be standing there constantly watching. And in fact, what's really cool is in here, they have a magical control panel that allows them to control the gates, the lights, and a loudspeaker that is positioned all around. So if you have a person that has a background of being a prisoner at Revel's End, or they escaped from Revel's End, then you should go ahead and give them the floor plan of the area that they would have at least been to. Because it makes sense, you know, they, they should know a location that they presumably spend a decent amount of time in. And even more so, if they are an escapee, then you need to come up with a way on how they escaped. Whether that's you coming up with it, or them coming up with it, or it's a combined thing. You know, you should totally come up with that, because escaping this place is pretty freaking hard. You know, you're constantly shackled, you're in an anti-magic field half the time, you're in the middle of the frozen tundra. How the heck did you escape? Anything's possible, really. So, you know, sky's the limit. Up the spiral staircase in the center of the surveillance area, we have Area 20, the Hall of Absolution. And this is an area meeting where the council comes to vote on commuting someone. In Area 21, we have the Warden's Quarters, and it's here where we get really good information on the current Warden, Marta Marthanus. Warden Marthanus might be working for the Lord's Alliance, but she is secretly a member of the Harpers, and she feeds a lot of information that she overhears in the prison, of course, to the Harpers. But having this one weird thing isn't enough. She also has another strange thing. Before she became a warden here, she was sort of an adventurer. And unfortunately, on her travels as an adventurer, one of her companions died. He was a shield dwarf named Vlax Braun Anvil. And when he died, his ghost actually inhabited our poor warden's body. Once or twice a day, for one to two hours, the dwarf takes over the warden's body and all of a sudden starts speaking in dwarvish and starts getting drunk 
and unfortunately she can't really do anything constructive during that time she knows for a fact that she can get rid of this guy's spirit she knows that all she has to do is go to Gauntlegrim, which is located in the Underdark, to rid herself of the spiritual inhabitant. But the thing is, is she likes Vlax. You know, he's a he was a cool dude, and that was her traveling companion and adventuring friend. And she hasn't, you know, steeled herself to getting rid of this guy's spirit. So for the current being time, she is currently, every once in a while, transforming into a dwarf that drinks and, you know, gets a little rowdy. And unfortunately, during that time, she can't even cast spells, which is really bad, because she's in fact a mage. She's a very powerful caster. So you should totally play that up. You should go ahead and say that during a 24-hour period, you go ahead and roll a dice and determine what time of the day that she gets inhabited by, because the first time your players meet this person, it could just be a normal meeting. But the first time they meet this person, it could be all of a sudden just seeing this warden acting a little unprofessional, getting drunk on the job, and you know, speaking dwarvish and not making any sense. If your players somehow make it up all the way to this tower and start looting the place, they can actually find a pretty decent amount of gold here and also really cool a wand of binding. The wand of binding looks cool and of course it makes sense that a warden of a prison would have it because you can cast hold person and hold monster. So pretty awesome item and pretty thematic. In Area 22, the Warden's Office, there is just a whole bunch of dry, boring paperwork involving all the prisoners here. But what's interesting is, is there is a record included of all the death certificates of all the prisoners that have been here. But the cause of death is listed as either natural, accidental, or unnatural, and with no details. So that's kind of, kind of freaky to think about. There's a prisoners that are dying, and sometimes they're just labeling it as natural, accidental, or unnatural. Why are these people dying? Who knows? Do we have a Shawshank Redemption kind of system going on here where every once in a while someone gets beat up to death? Are people being left out in the snow and just forgot about and then they die? You know, there's a lot of ways that these people could be dying uh, accidentally or unnaturally. So definitely keep that into consideration if people start asking questions, why are these people dying? In Area 23, we have the tower roof and we get some cool information here that a airship can actually be docked here, which you can totally play out in your campaign should you desire. If there's airships running around or if your players get the it ascendant working and start traveling around in that, that could definitely be a way to get people to Rebel's End. And lastly for this area, we get Prisoner 237 Baelish Gant. So Baelish Gant, as I said earlier, he tried taking over the Ten Towns because he wanted the Arcane Brotherhood's network to be a little bit better here. He did this, however, not with the Arcane Brotherhood's actual authority. He simply just did it on his own. And, unfortunately for him, he got caught. A party of adventurers thwarted his criminal ventures and captured him. And instead of putting this guy to death, the Council of the Speaker of the Ten Towns made a deal with the representatives of the Lord's Alliance to have Gant to serve a life sentence in Revel's End. Ooh, a life sentence. That would suck. So he, for a while, thought that the Arcane Brotherhood was going to go ahead and release him somehow, but... But after a few years, you know, nothing's changing, nothing's happening, he hasn't gotten any word, so it's probably best to assume that the Arcane Brotherhood doesn't really care about this guy. And they'd be correct, because <laughs> that guy's probably bad PR. We get a ton of information on role-playing Baelish Gant, and what it states here is that this guy is pompous, and he always acts like he's the smartest person in the room. Which, to be fair, he probably is. He's got a 17 intelligence, you know. I promise you, other than the wizards and artificers in the party, they're probably not going to have intelligence as a high stat. So it makes sense that this guy, you know, thinks he's pretty smart. But most important of all is the fact that this guy doesn't have anything on him. He can't cast any of his spells, and even if he were able to cast some of his spells, then he's got an anti-magic field that's always encompassing him, so he can't really do too much. If characters come to talk to this guy, he's going to promise them everything to get out of here. He's going to say that, oh, I've got some magical items that I got stashed away. You know, go ahead and uh, free me and I'll totally lead you to them. Oh, I've got a lot of gold. Hey, you know, I could give you something. He's going to say anything he can because, man, does being in prison here suck. So he was in prison before the Arcane Brotherhood actually sent all the representatives here. But the thing is, if your players come here and start asking questions about the Arcane Brotherhood... He is immediately obviously going to take note of, oh hey, the Arcane Brothers here is here because people are asking questions about it. He did overhear years ago that there was going to be an expedition mounted to find the lost Nethery city buried in the Ragged Glacier. 
but he doesn't know in particular who is actually being sent on this expedition. He sadly doesn't have any information on the Nethery city, but he does know that it exists, and he knows that, of course, the Arcade Brotherhood is looking for it. He can go ahead and tell the players a little bit about Netheril. He can say that their civilization was powerful wizards more than a thousand years ago. He can go ahead and say that they were able to cast magics beyond your comprehensions. And even more so, you should totally present the fact that these people got their powers from the Nether Scrolls. And these Nether Scrolls were super powerful. And more so, you should totally tell your players, basically mechanically, that these were 10th level and higher level spells. As of right now, in the D&D universe, players are only able to get to 9th level spells because magic is essentially capped. But back then, people were able to cast 10th level and 11th level spells. And lastly, he can go ahead and say that there was evil subterranean creatures named Ferrum that are floating around the place. And if your players explored the Lost Spire of Netheril, they can maybe learn some information on this stuff. But the real reason why the Netheril Empire fell was because Karsus, a Netherese archmage, tried usurping the power of Mistral, the god of magic. He failed and destroyed himself and teared the weave apart and magic went all cattywampus all in the multiverse. If your players actually ask about specific members of the Arcane Brotherhood because they had heard of them before or if they met them, then he can go ahead and give the following information. In regards of Avarice, the tiefling albino, I think she has a promising future. Presumably he hasn't met with her too much and doesn't know that she is totally evil and all that. Or maybe he does know that she's evil and knows that evil people get away with everything. About Xan, he's a red wizard. Need I say more? And of course, if your players don't know that Xan's a red wizard and get told that he's a red wizard, that can be a revelation because red wizards are typically evil and they totally are evil. About Naz Lantimir, Gant will simply say, she's a nobody. And about Velen Harpel, Gant will say, Had a powerful member of her family not pulled strings to get her into the Brotherhood, that old scarecrow would still be reanimating dead cats in a long saddle. Once again, kind of pressing on the issue of Velen Harpel is just getting along because she is part of a famous family. There is, of course, a ton of things you can have Valish Gant say. This guy is interesting. He has a background in the Arcane Brotherhood, and maybe he can let slip some of the Arcane Brotherhood secrets. He could go ahead and say, hey, I know more about the Netherese city, but you gotta get me free or else I won't tell you anything. You can play this guy up as a lot of things because this guy is pretty unique. He's pretty interesting. He, of course, can be a really good source of exposition in this campaign because this guy could potentially know a lot. Or more importantly, he could say that he knows a lot and all of a sudden prompt your players into getting into a super duper elaborate prison escape attempt. A lot of things could happen here. Ultimately though, Revel's End doesn't have too much going on for it in regards of story hooks and beats, but there is so many things you can do with this place. There are so many interesting prisoners you can throw in here. There's so many things you can do with Prisoner 237. There's so many things you can do with the Warden here and the Council and the fact that this place could be one of the locations that your players have to go to in order for them to book travel to O'Reel's abode. There is so many excellent story beats that can drive your players here, but unfortunately you are going to be the one to have to fill out those story beats, and once they arrive here, you are going to be the one to have to flesh this place out. Once again, I strongly advise you to go ahead and talk to other DMs about what they plan on doing with this prison. I once again strongly recommend that if you have a player that has a background tied to Revel's End, either they serve their time here or they escaped, go ahead and do that constructive world building and figure out what they were doing here, how they got there, and how they got out. Do things with this place because this is just an empty slate and we're meant to, to chisel this place out. I think Revel's End can be a really good source of inspiration for a lot of DMs here and I think there's a lot of things you can do with this place. But unfortunately, as of right this second, there is a lot of empty space here. You have to flesh this place out. You have to make it seem real and you have to tie it to the world, which is a little bit hard to do because on design, it is detached from the rest of the world. So keep all these things in mind and I'm sure that you can go ahead and make Revel's End a fantastic place for your players. Other than all that though, really not much more to say. Make this place your own, talk to other people, find out what they're doing, and bounce ideas off because this place can be absolutely incredible and this place can be super duper awesome.